Well, welcome everyone. My name is Emily Singer Lucio. I'm the ADA 504 coordinator for the University of Maryland. Um, Dimitri, can you go ahead and put my email in the chat just so people have it? Um, so uh, my job is making sure that the university is compliant with the ADA. And one of the things that I try and focus on and help people understand is how you make events and meetings accessible to everybody. Um, so things to look at when planning an accessible event, publicity and registration, event location, audio and visual, including accessible media content, seating, dietary restrictions, and web-based meetings. So we're gonna cover a little bit of all of that today. Um, publicizing events. So first thing and most important that we can do to show we are being accessible and open and welcoming to people with disabilities is add an accessibility notice on our flyers, on our electronic notices, on our registrations. Um, and we do have some suggested language. It just says for disability accommodations, please contact. And you want to put the event organizer and a point and an email or phone number for the event organizer. And the reason I say to put the event organizer is that way, if they if there are questions related to your event, you know how to address that. Because if they if you gave my information, I wouldn't know anything about your event. I don't know whether it's a um, a, a lecture or a breakout session or anything of that nature. So. This way they can work with you to get the accommodations they need. And if you have follow-up questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. The other thing you can do is, is add a question on your registration form that says, please let us know if you need any accommodations. That's always helpful too. Event location, obviously we always strive to ensure that our events are in accessible rooms whenever possible. So if for any reason a non-accessible meeting room is chosen and the sponsor receives a request for an individual with a disability um, to be in an accessible location, it really is the responsibility of the event sponsor to make every effort to work with whoever schedules rooms to find an alternative location that is accessible. We do have an obligation to, to do a, make a good faith effort to try and ensure that the room is accessible every single time. Um, if you're anticipating people driving, um, parking, you want to just double check and make sure there's accessible parking and an accessible path of travel from the parking to your event site, um, making sure that there is an accessible entrance, um, and make sure that, you know, if, if the route is not that easy to find, perhaps highlighting what the route is so people know. Um, event location, also you want to make sure, uh, does the entrance have automatic doors? Um, is the meeting room, does it have fixed seating? Are there areas for wheelchairs? or can the room be set up or modified to allow room for a wheelchair? One of the things I talk with event organizers about all the time is, is when you set up rows of chairs, making sure to leave room for a wheelchair on some of the rows, or maybe leaving enough room in between the rows for somebody to walk through, um, making sure that all of that's done in advance. Also making sure there's an accessible restroom that's ADA compliant near your event. Audio and visual. So when putting an, on an event, the organizer has the responsibility under the ADA to ensure all content is accessible. So that includes providing appropriate auxiliary aids and services when necessary to ensure effective communication with individuals with disabilities. So I'm gonna cover some of this a little bit more in detail. So first of all, accessible media content. So as a public institution, we are required to, to comply with the WCAG accessibility guidelines um, ensuring that all electronic information is accessible. I'm not gonna get into the WCAG guidelines today, but if you want more information about that, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, even more importantly, making sure content is accessible is an essential part of our culture, culture of inclusion and another example of our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm gonna sh show you quickly. We do have an accessible media content website, which I put the link to in the slides, and I will put the link to quickly in the chat. Um, that really quickly. This is the link to the accessible media content and it goes over media structure, tables, links, color and contrast is critically important lists and creating accessible PDFs. Um, just as a side note, if you have a website and then you put an inaccessible PDF attached to that website, you are there by making the website inaccessible and we'd like to try and avoid that because um, we don't want to be out of compliance with our websites. Um, 
the other thing that's to know about ensuring effective communication is that includes ASL interpreters. So there are ways to arrange for ASL interpreters. You would have to pay for that out of your budgets, but there are available, they, they can be reserved. Um, transcribers are part. You can consider using um, uh, Zoom captioning or Google captioning for slides or, or PowerPoint has captioning. You just need a screen and a projector and a good microphone. Um, that is not a full substitute, but it is a good option if you don't have anything else available. Um, but if a person requests a, a cart transcription or a full transcriber, you would have to provide that. Um, I always recommend having alternative formats or of your materials, and that may be simply sending them an electronic copy of the materials, and then they can use it on their Braille reader or whatever type of screen reader device they use. But some people may ask for a large print copy or a Braille copy. Large print is easy to do. Braille is a little bit more complicated. I will say that we get very few requests for Braille these days. But if that is our personal preference, we do have to be able to adjust to that. But most of the time, you can send it electronically, and then they can read it through their Braille reader. Um, video captioning, which I just talked a little bit about. Um, oh, actually, video, like if you're showing a video, like a pre-done video, please make sure that the video has captioning on it. That's critically important. Um, if you're using a PowerPoint, it's, I always find it helpful to describe anything on there, especially if you're going to put any types of images or diagrams on there. Um, and you've got somebody who's blind or low vision attending, you want to make sure to describe them. Assistive listening devices, we do have assistive listening devices for those who are, are um, uh, have hearing issues on campus uh, or attending your event. Um, they can, for students, they can be res reserved through the um, assistive, uh, sorry, the accessibility office. Um, or most lecture halls have assistive technology built into the AV system and the reserve receiver can be checked out from the classroom support office. Seiku Stadium and Xfinity also have assistive listening devices and the Clarice also has assistive listening devices. I mentioned about interpreters and transcribing a second ago. So you want to work with communication access services that is part of ADS to reserve interpreters and transcribers once you have a date for the event. I always encourage people to reserve them as soon as they have the date set and make a note of the cancellation policy. It is much easier to get an interpreter when you're planning the event than it is um, um, at the last minute. Um, and that can also sometimes be more expensive. But they do often have a cancellation policy that says if you cancel three days in advance, you won't be charged. So if you don't, if you put this notice statement that I mentioned at the beginning on your um, event notification and no one contacts you and it's three days in advance, go ahead and cancel them because you haven't had a request and you'd be okay. The caveat is to that is, is that if you get a late request for an interpreter after you've already canceled them, what you can say to them is, is that we are going to make a good faith effort to try and get somebody, but we can't guarantee it due to the late date. We have to still continue to make a good faith effort. But when you're reserving the interpreters, make sure you know the date and time of the event, the location, and the structure of the program. Is it one speaker, multiple speakers, a lecture, discussion? Are there going to be slides, breakout sessions? That will help the interpreter group know what, how many interpreters you need and for how long. I mentioned about alternative print formats. I also went over this already a little bit. So in advance, you can either email them a copy or you can provide large print or braille. If you can, on the day of the event, have a few large print copies. People sometimes say to me, well, I had large print copies available, but no one asked for them. And then I say, well, did you publicize that they were available or did you offer them to people as they walked in? And they said, oh, no, I didn't think about that. So just make sure everyone knows who has the large print copies and then maybe put it in the program that large print copies are available if people upon request. You also wanna make sure that any documents you have are accessible. So to ensure equal access, you want to make sure that you have um, um, that these guidelines are followed, right? That there's a copy in a Microsoft Word document. You want to try and avoid using images unless an alt tag description can be provided on an electronic version. Do not use text boxes or frames. Screen readers cannot read over text boxes or frames. Include a statement in the text that the publication is available in an alternative format upon request and supply contact information. So again, they can email you and get a copy of that if you need um, Finished print publications, you also want to try and ensure that they are, they are in um, a file type that can be converted 
to dot to braille or large print if necessary. Um, so we like to suggest that they're emailed as a text only or an MS Word file um, that they can put in then whatever file or format they need so that their screen reading device can read it. Um, if someone requests materials in Braille, you can work with somebody in the ADS office to produce the materials. They have contacts about that. If the requester cannot receive email and requests a copy in large print, I recommend you increase the font size as they request. They can tell you how large they want it. Um, and you may need to reorient the copy. So vertical as opposed to horizontal, for example. Um, and then you can send them a copy um, electronically if that's also helpful. And you can also reserve a copy for them at the event. There is a couple large print resources that may also be helpful. I will put these links in the chat real quick. Oops, let me just do that real quick. Um, this is one of them. And other one, designing for screen reader capability. You can save all these links. Um, okay. Um, so oftentimes we're using PowerPoints or Google Slides. So you want to use a sans serif font that is at least 18 point to 22 is preferred. Use light colored background with dark text. Use a plain background without any watermark, photo, or design behind the text. Use a PowerPoint theme to structure your presentation with only short sentences or bulleted phrases. And make sure to read and describe things on your PowerPoint during a live presentation. So just visualize. Picture like if somebody was at your presentation and they had no limited or no vision and they couldn't see what you were talking about. I know oftentimes we have a tendency to paraphrase what's on our slides and assuming that everyone's reading them behind us, but there may be somebody who can't. Um, you want to also keep it short um, as a rule, one slide for every two minutes of speaking time. Photographs, images, clip arts, graphics, ma uh, maps, charts cannot be read by screen readers. Um, so you want to make sure you've embedded alt text or long descriptions with images and other graphic elements. So again, if you can send the PowerPoints to the person in advance um, as a plain text file, then that will help them. You can also make your PowerPoints accessible, and there's links here. Um, let me back. This is through our IT accessibility website. Um, so I talked about seating earlier um, that you may need to have, if you're going to have an interpreter, you want to have reserved seating. Um, so people who need the interpreter can sit up front within, within the clear line of sight of the interpreter. Um, you also want to make sure that there's spaces for wheelchairs. Um, and then understand that if you're in a stadium or, or auditorium setting, that guests with limited mobility may not be able to walk up or down the stairs easily or, you know, sidestep into the middle of the row. So I always recommend making sure you're leaving, marking seats available at the top or near the entrance available so they only have to walk down one step in the aisles um, and that type of thing. And then if there, there is a presenter at the bottom and they are planning to, to do a some type of, you know, meet and greet afterwards, please make sure that that's in an accessible location. So anybody who is at the top, either in a wheelchair or limited mobility can also get to the presenter. One other thing real quick I'm gonna say before moving into dietary restrictions is that you also wanna keep in mind the needs of the presenter. If you're, if you're inviting somebody on campus, you may wanna ask them, do you have any accessibility needs that we need to be aware of when planning the events? And so that's always helpful to ask the presenter. If, they're, um, if you're serving food at the event, Again, I suggest on the um, registration form asking if there's any dietary needs. Um, I think most people at this point provide things in vegetarian or vegan or gluten-free options, but you know I recommend doing that by default. Um, but some people may have other food allergies or issues that they need to address. And so including a statement or offering other types of options is always good. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of us do web-based meetings these days, and so accessibility of your webinars will always begin and end with the webinar platform you're using. So obviously, if you're using Zoom, including captionings, captioning, um, and making sure that the event is accessible. If the program is not accessible or does not include certain types of integrated features, your ability to provide access will be limited. So, for example, 
If someone on a screen reader can use the raise hand feature, how do they do that? Zoom has the capability and their accessibility features to do that, so just be aware of that. Um, you want to explain communication expectations for your meeting, like using the raise hand feature, asking questions in the chat, um, saying whether attendees can unmute themselves or not. I always think that's a good idea to do at, at the beginning of meetings. Um, provide slides and materials in alternative formats, including plain text versions. Um, you want to have the Zoom auto live transcript is available. Um, so you can choose to save the transcript and have the in, in how, and how to enable the Zoom live transcript feature at, U, at UMD. Oops. Um, provide a captioned recording with the slides after the event. We often post, when, whenever we post a video on our website, we ensure that the captions are included and that there's also a transcript. So, because um, again, you want to make sure your website is accessible. So if you put up a video without a captioning or transcript, then the website is not accessible. Um, also, audio, describe any visual relevant content. And then again, we have UMD accessibility guides for Zoom presentations that I will put in the chat. That would be helpful as well. Hey, Emily. There is a question in the chat asking if the slides will be available. So yes, yeah, so we are going to send out a follow-up email after this after the webinar with the slides and other information and some of the links. And then um, we will also be posting them on um, our website, the, the webinar on our website as well. Um, okay, so editing presentations and websites for colorblindness. So you want to use patterns and textures to show contrasting graphs and charts. Use colors and symbols to convey error messages. Add text labels to color filters and swatches. Underline links to differentiate between regular text and anchor text. Avoid using poor color combinations such as green, red, and blue, and purple. Use size, placement, or font weights to make primary buttons stand out. Mark required form fields with a symbol such as an asterisk or label them. So those are some of the things you can do in terms of color blindness. Um, I'm also gonna give you another link about designing things, dealing with addressing color blindness. Um, okay. A couple other things on web-based meetings. Um, so accessibility of all features of the program through keyboard shortcuts without the use of a mouse. You want to make sure that people can access those things. Most of the time, Zoom can do that. Keyboard commands that allow the user to move between multiple windows on their computers. Again, Zoom does allow you to do that. The capacity to resize the captions, change the color of the text and font, get the flexibility to move the captioning. Again, Zoom does allow you to do that. So if you're using a different platform, just make sure that those things are also available. Um, if you have web-based announcements and registrations, when building your web applications or websites to announce and register for an event, please make sure that you're choosing a content management system that supports accessibility. You're using headings correctly to organize the structure of your content. You're including proper alt text for images, and you're giving all links to unique and descriptive names. Web-based announcements and registration. You want to use color appropriately, design all forms for accessibility, use tables for tabular data, not for layout. Ensure that all content can be accessed with a keyboard alone in a logical way and include an, any include an accommodations question on the registration form as we talked about. There are a few other websites that I will put in the chat right now um, for making websites accessible. Um, I want to highlight this real quick because um, this is our digital accessibility website, and you can find all sorts of information here about um, making uh, uh, website ex white websites accessible, courses accessible, um, documents accessible, including PDFs, uh, Microsoft documents, Google Workspace accessibility, um, testing your site with web with site improve. You can test any website with site improve. There's web accessibility evaluation guidelines, um, web, web accessibility tutorials. All this information is on here. The reason I want to highlight this real quick is because um, the Department of Justice recently um, uh, adopted the WCAG standards, which I mentioned earlier. They were just standards earlier, even though we've always had a web accessibility policy. The Department of Justice has now said we will enforce in compliance for all Title II institutions, which we are a Title II institution. 
to ensure that websites are accessible. So it is critically important that you make sure your websites and any electronic media, and this includes social media um, and um, any type of app apps as well. So make please make sure your websites and everything else are accessible. Um, there's a few other resources. Um, I'm going to highlight my website real quick. Um, this is a page on my website that's planning an accessible event. There's a lot of information on here about that I've gone over, but it's more in depth here. There's a checklist here about making sure your event is accessible, scheduling in accessible rooms like we talked about, room setup, events, announcements, and registration, um, accessible communications, which you talked about, virtual events, uh, dietary restrictions, um, day of considerations, communication considerations with presenters, disability etiquette, general information on service animals, and then many of the resources that I've mentioned are already on this website. And then this is an older version of this same presentation, but it is also on our website if you want it. Um, while I'm here, I'm going to highlight the accessibility website. If you've not been to the accessibility website before, um, it's pretty easy to find. It's accessibility.umd.edu. I just put it in the chat. Um, but this is a one-stop shop for everything about accessibility on campus accommodations. So any questions people have about student accommodations, faculty accommodations, staff accommodations, employment resources or on accommodations, technology, um, the page I just showed you earlier, the IT Accessibility Hub, um, our procurement process. If you're procuring any type of software, we have to make sure it's accessible. Web-based course accessibility, that's right here, and accessible media content. That was one of the first links I gave you earlier in the, in the training. Um, if any of you are faculty, there's all sorts of information here about responsibilities, legal information, fundamental alterations, making classes accessible, how you can help service animals in lab, and other teaching resources. Um, and the event accessibility page that I told you about already, on-campus resources, uh, campus access, just making sure that tells about campus access at various places on campus. Um, then we have our physical access page with our campus map. There's a navigation area where you can check off the um, wheelchair and then find your way from point to point on the accessible path. Construction updates, um, wheels off walkway, our accessible design criteria, elevator access, um, elevator outages, service impacts, and you can subscribe to the FM work notices here and then more about wheels off walkway. Um, we have transportation information, visitors to campus, emergency preparedness for individuals with disabilities, um, student organizations that deal with disabilities, campus disability working groups and departments, um, all dealing with disabilities, our various policies, um, our accessibility policy. I mentioned our web accessibility policy. We are gonna be updating that, both of these actually soon. Um, our video captioning standard. So we do have a video captioning standard, which I will put a link to in the chat. So you have that as well. Um, service and support animal information, um, our student disability resolution procedures, our faculty and staff disability resolution procedures, our, um, and then just information about my office, general disability information, Demystifying Disability, Ableism and How to Be a Better Ally, Disability Awareness Month. And we do, um, October is Disability Awareness Month, and we do a series of podcasts. We've done um, them since 2022. Um, we have four from 2022, four from 2023. And then we have, uh, we have two from 2024 so far, but we'll make sure those get up there. Um, but those, that is pretty much what I want to talk about. I'm going to stop screen sharing. Uh, actually, let me just check my slides real quick. Um, I'll give you the resources. Uh, and then I went over the website just to show you about that. And then that's my contact information. I hope that information was helpful. I know it was probably a lot. Um, and again, you can feel free to reach out to me anytime if there are questions. Um, I do hope this was helpful. Um, thank you all very much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.